Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about solubility. So solubility defines the amount of solute that can dissolve in a certain amount of solvent. And so it's temperature sensitive. So usually when solubility is reported, they report it at whatever temperature they were measuring it. But besides temperature, usually it's expressed as grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent, which is typically water. So grams of solute per 100 grams of water is typically what you'll see for solubility. Now there's two terms we have to describe uh, solutions. We have unsaturated, which means a solution that has not dissolved the maximum amount that's possible. So in this example here, we're sprinkling a little bit of salt in a beaker of water, the salt dissolves. But if we were to sprinkle more salt, it could also dissolve. And so the solution is said to be unsaturated because it hasn't dissolved the maximum amount of salt yet. Now, on the other hand, you can have a saturated solution, and that's when the solvent can't dissolve any more solute. So if we dump the whole bottle of salt in there, uh, a lot of it will dissolve, but some of it will settle on the bottom. And no matter how long you sit or stir, no more salt can dissolve in, and the solution is said to be saturated. And so uh, it's important to note that this is an equilibrium process. So some of these salt particles may dissolve in, but some of the dissolved ones may precipitate back out, and it's in dynamic equilibrium. So the net amount of dissolved salt doesn't change. A quick study check. Label each of the following solutions as saturated or unsaturated. If salt disappears when you put it in water, well, that would be unsaturated. And if you add sugar to a cup of water, but it doesn't dissolve and it sits at the bottom of the cup, well, that must be saturated because it can't dissolve anymore. So here's a problem involving some math. So they tell you at 40 degrees Celsius, the maximum solubility of potassium bromide is 80 grams per 100 grams of water. So whenever they give you an amount, uh, a solubility amount, uh, you can express this as a decimal, and that might be easier for comparisons. So if we have 80 grams of KBr, per 100 grams of H2O, you can express that as a decimal, 0 0.8 grams of KBr per gram of H2O, so 0 0.8. Now, for situation A, we have 60 grams in 100 grams of water. So 60 over 100 is the same thing as 0 0.6. So if you compare that to our value of 0 0.8, it's less than the maximum. And so we would say that this is unsaturated. Now, part B, the second situation. If you have 200 grams of KBr and 200 grams of water, so 200 divided by 200 equals 1.0. That is more than the maximum solubility, and so this would be saturated. Not all of this KBr would even dissolve. And the third situation here, if you have 25 grams of KBr in 50 grams of water, so 25 over 50 is the same thing as 0 0.5, and so 0 0.5 is less than 0 0.8, so this would also be unsaturated. So once again, if they give you maximum solubility as a fraction, just convert it to a decimal, then it'll make your life a lot easier when you're comparing values. So the next thing we want to talk about is the effect of temperature on solubility. Now, there's two situations here. Um, one is for solids. So let's just focus on solids. 
So solids increase as temperature increases. So the hotter the solvent, the more solid will dissolve in it. So let's blow this graph up so you can look at it. And this is showing you solubility here. And whoops, let's wait those. So solubility on the left, temperature uh, on the bottom axis. And so you can see that as temperature increases, solubility also increases, which makes sense. I don't know if you've ever tried to dissolve sugar in your iced coffee. You'll notice it doesn't dissolve very well, but if you put sugar in hot coffee, it dissolves really easily. Temperature affects solubility. So higher temperature, solids become more soluble. And that's because the water molecules have more energy. And so it's easier for them to surround the particles and give them a hydration shell. Now, the opposite trend is true for gases. And so if we're talking about gases, uh, you would have a trend that looks like this. So as temperature increases, solubility would decrease. And so gases are more soluble at colder temperatures. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had a warm soda, but all the carbonation leaves immediately when it's warm versus ice cold soda, it's more carbonated. And that you know, phenomena is what you're noticing here with the graph, right? A hot soda, you're gonna have less solubility of the gas, so the bubbles just leave. But colder temperature, gases are more soluble. Now, the third thing we wanna look at is solubility and pressure. Now, once again, we're talking about gases here. In a pressurized system, gases can become more soluble, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you look at the inside of this soda can here, if it's pressurized and you have a bunch of gas molecules all packed in there, they have nowhere to go except into the solution. And so if you pressurize a gas, you can force it to dissolve more than it normally wants to. But as soon as you release the pressure, all the gas molecules want to fly away and then they will you know, evaporate out of the solution. And that's what carbonation is. It's the bubbles that were dissolved in the liquid becoming undissolved and bubbling away as gas. So more pressure, more solubility. Less pressure, less solubility. A quick study check. Why would a bottle of a carbonated drink possibly burst if it's left out in the sun? Well, a carbonated drink is a gas dissolved. And so as you increase temperature, solubility decreases. And so the gases would want to bubble out of solution and they could possibly explode the container. Now, why do fish die when the water is too warm? Well, fish breathe oxygen that's dissolved in the water. And so warmer water has less oxygen in it. So there's actually more oxygen in cold uh, water. So like oceans and rivers can support more life than like a warm pond can because there's more oxygen in cold water. So the next thing we want to talk about is solubility rules for ionic compounds or salts, if you will. Not all ionic compounds are soluble. There's no rationale to this other than it was experimentally determined. Now, I will give you this table on the exam. You don't have to memorize this, but you do need to be able to interpret it. So let's take a look at some common ionic compounds. Let's say we've got, uh, I don't know, KCl versus Na2SO4 versus, uh, I don't know, FeBr3 versus 
FES versus AGCL. Okay, that's enough. So these are all different ionic compounds. You know they're ionic because they have a metal and a non-metal. But how can we predict whether or not these will dissolve in water? Well, let's take a look at our solubility table here. Everything on the left of the table is soluble. Things on the right side are insoluble. So when we're looking at KCl here, it's got a potassium. And we know that anything with potassium is soluble. So I would expect this compound to dissolve in water. Now, what about iron bromide? Well, iron is not listed on here. So let's take a look at bromide. Pretty much anything with bromide is soluble unless it's silver, lead, or mercury. Well, this is not silver, lead, or mercury, so I would expect this to dissolve in water. Now, what about silver chloride? Anything with chloride is soluble unless it's silver, lead, or mercury. Well, this is silver, so this is not going to dissolve. Sodium sulfate. Well, anything with sodium is soluble and there's no exceptions, so that's definitely going to dissolve. And what about iron sulfide? Well, we see down here, anything that's a sulfide is typically insoluble. So this one will not dissolve. Okay. So if you have an ionic compound, you're not sure if it'll dissolve, check your solubility rules and make your determination based on those. And once again, this is available on the exam, so don't try and memorize this. And the last thing is just an example of an insoluble compound. So barium sulfate, right? Sulfates are usually soluble unless they're with barium. The barium sulfate is insoluble, and we use this in medical imaging. So if they want to x-ray your digestive tract, they'll have you drink a slurry of barium sulfate. And then when they take the x-ray, uh, the barium sulfate actually absorbs the x-rays. And so you can see the digestive tract, whereas normally it would just be invisible on an x-ray. So just one example of how you can take advantage of solubility. So thanks for watching. See you in the next video.